I am joined by Michael Josem of Liberal Van and the Manx Taxpayers Alliance, who's standing in Douglas East. Now, um, first and foremost, uh, Mr Josem, a question coming at a slightly different angle than the normal question here. Do you think you're a local or a national politician? So I don't see a conflict between the two. Um, I think that the best way to represent the interests of Douglas East is to is to include and to consider all the issues. Uh, and so that's why, you know, speaking to local residents, they've told me about the importance of Douglas Promenade, which obviously goes through the heart of Douglas East. That's a local issue, but it also becomes a national issue in how our Department of Infrastructure is, is led and managed and, uh, and guided. And a lot of your policies, they're focused on the broad brush issues, affordable housing, you've mentioned particularly. Do, do you think that you're missing some of the, the, the local ones, the Douglas East issues, the parking issues at all? Sure. So if we if we talk about Douglas East specifically, you know, obviously the promenade is 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 a, is a big issue chatting to local residents. Uh, but also as we go throughout the the constituency, um, in fact, talking of Douglas Prom, you know, the the Rotary Club has uh, has uh, had a fall in membership over the last ten years by about half. Um, the Methodist Church attendance has dropped by about half. Um, for once upon a time, we used to have uh, have basketball games. Um, for, for, for men and, and, and especially for women um, down at, uh, at Summerland. Uh, and so those, th- those community institutions are the core of Douglas East, um, but they also reflect a broader challenge in our community and in, in, in our civilization um, to, to overcome um, and, and to rebuild as we come back, bounce back better from mm. the pandemic. So you think you can marry those two up. But I want to ask you, you did uh, take part in the Douglas South uh, by-election last uh, year. You lost out narrowly. Um, Why are you coming back for more? What makes you sort of confident that you can deliver in Douglas East? So I think what's what's important to remember is that there's no shame in getting knocked down. And there's only shame in st- in staying down, uh, and so and I, and I think what's really important here is you know Douglas East. It's it's my community. It's where I work. It's where my office is. It's where I play. It's where I serve. Uh, and so you know I, obviously I've got a long you know connection to Douglas East. Uh, you know I first moved to the to the promenade I guess, more than ten years ago now, uh, and uh, and you know I've lived throughout Douglas, and I think I spent even six months living over in Onkin. Uh, but you know what I think is really important there is that. Every week, when I'm volunteering for the food bank and I deliver food to the to the to the people in need in Douglas East, I see that they need someone who will stand up for all of us, not just um, the establishment, not just the insiders, but someone who will be a voice for all of us. And we'll get to those issues. But um, just revisiting last year, do you have you identified why you think you missed out? I think I think that the the, the best people to ask is is the, is the voters, uh, and so I think that that's a question you'd better put put to them. OK, well, we'll work um, on to your sort of uh, allegiances then, Liberal Vannon and the Manx Taxpayers Alliance. Now, um, you, you sort of stepped away from Liberal Vannon and then stepped back towards them. So what should the voters make of that? So, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what your understanding is, but I, I formerly served as the chair of Liberal Vannon. Um, I now serve as the secretary of Liberal Vannon. Uh, you know, there was well, my good friend Paul Weatherall was able to take on, on that task, uh, you know, I wanted to ensure that you know when I engaged in my own personal prof- professional activities, I was I was not the chair. Um, you know, I served as the chair for you know a year and a half or thereabouts, um, and I thought that was the right time to conclude that. I certainly have not stepped away from Liberal Vannon at all. I'm a, I've been a member continuously. I, I'm, I'm still the secretary of the thing, uh, and uh, that continues. To well, the, the Manx Taxpayers Alliance, then, which you did create in a professional capacity, then, do you think there's a, a conflict between Liberal Vannon and the Manx Taxpayers Alliance? No. What are the aims of the Manx Taxpayers Alliance, to clarify? Sure. So the Manx Taxpayers Alliance is a not-for-profit lobby group, you know, and akin to maybe the Manx Farmers Union or the Chamber of Commerce or the Trade Union. And it's about um, uh, being a strong advocate for transparency in government uh, to ensure that we get good value for money uh, and to ensure that taxes remain uh, low, fair and simple. Why not just do that through Liberal Vannon? Well, this, I, I think they're a separate organisation, uh, and I think that our community, as, as I was saying earlier, is is challenged by a lack of institutions. It's really important to build up new and and strong institutions but, in our community. But so couldn't Liberal be... Vannon offer that challenge? Well, I, I guess you'd have to put it to Liberal Vannon. Um, I, I think that they're different organisations for for different purposes. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I think that 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 they are di- one is a political party and one is not a political party. But one both have political aims. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. So, so there is very strict regulation about what is and what is not a political party, uh, and so and so. I think that we need to remember here that these sort of trivialities about about the regulatory environment of political parties is is is, is a bit of a distraction. But you don't to... think the Max Taxpayers Alliance are lobbying for political things like lower taxes and better spending of public money? So, so, I'm, so I, 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 I think that the the Max Taxpayers Alliance is a strong 
and, and is building to become a, a strong lobby group, like the Manx Farmers Union, like the trade union movement, like the Chambers of Commerce. And, and, and I think it's about time we had someone who, who, who stood up for the poor guy who, and, the, and the poor women who have to pay for all the... The, these things that this government keeps on doing. But you don't think there's any confusion for the voter there with you being Liberal Vannon and Max Taxpayers Alliance? You don't think there's any confusion? So, so I'm endorsed by a political party being Liberal Vannon, uh, but I also have a full-time job. Uh, I think that just as, you know, in fact, coming into the into the station this morning, I'll listen to, to Tim, an interview with Tim Johnson, who is, uh, who is a, a candidate, and he is a, a man who is a... Um, you know, has a full time job, and he also works for his um, his lobby group as well. And and I think that that's very normal, especially in a small community, for people to wear multiple things. And I'm absolutely involved in a whole bunch of different organisations, from the Manx Taxpayers Alliance, the Liberal Vannon, to the Isle of Man Netball, to the to the you know Isle of Man Food Bank, through to the you know whole bunch of different organisations. And I think it's really healthy to have people who are involved in our community. Well, there have been questions, and this is your opportunity to to meet them head on about the sort of. Um, funding of the Manx Taxpayers Alliance. Who else is in it? You always mention we, and we've only seen you from the Manx Taxpayers Alliance. Can you use this opportunity to just be transparent about who's backing it, who's behind it, as, yeah, as well yeah. as you? Sure. So the Manx Taxpayers Alliance is, is, is funded um, by, by various Manx residents, uh, and so that, that's, that's the situation. And do those residents, do they have a vested interest in what you do? I mean, obviously they do, because they... They, they assume they pay for you to do this. So do you not think uh, the public deserve to, to know a little bit more about why, you know, who those people are? Sure. So, that, so, so anyone who, who's a member of a, of a private association is welcome to do so. I think that, 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 that every member of a private association has a natural right to privacy. It is literally illegal for me to out them. Um, and let, let us also understand that there is a long and sordid history of trying to uh, uncover the private backers of private organisations. And, 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 it, and it is a history that was uh, arose in our civilization by white supremacists in, in Alabama uh, immediately after World War II who launched um, such, tried to do such things uh, into the National Association. It's just totally um, surely that's, that's deviating from the original question, which is, are you going to be transparent about who's supporting the Manx Taxpayers Alliance? So... so so every member is is welcome to, to 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 be private or public about their support as they wish. Uh, it is it is literally illegal for me to to you know. Obviously, we have privacy. But do you not think it matters to the voter to know who you're working for? If if who you're working for has a political or economic interest to gain from your activities in that role. So so I am employed by the by the Manx Taxpayers Alliance. Uh, that is my employer, uh, and you know, just as there are people who work for other organisations. I, I, I don't I don't see a difference between that and, you know, being expected to identify, you know, the customers and mm. supporters but, but, of, of but other the role, the role of you, you have in the Taxpayers Alliance isn't like a normal job because you're an active lobbyist, you're an advocate, you are public facing, you are... The, 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 the role of a lobbyist and an MHK is quite similar. Do you not see why that distinction uh, is quite blurred and why you need to be transparent about the motivations there? Uh, not really, and you know, I think that what is important to the voters and, and the people of Douglas East, as I, as I chat to them, is, is having someone who will stand up for them, someone who will who will, who will be a strong voice for protecting our environment, for protecting um, the the promenade, for protecting um, and building our, our economic future. And I think those are the issues. And I, I'm not really interested in having an argument about or conversation about about such distractions. So, so to clarify, you don't think there's uh, anything that you need to declare to the public that you think uh, would be pertinent in this case about the interests of the alliance? No. Okay. Uh, and would you step away from the alliance if you are successful in, in this election? Uh, I'd, I'd expect to, yes. Yeah. And that leads me to another question. Liberal Vannon has a history of candidates stepping away once they're in keys from the party. Now, some have said if a Liberal Vannon candidate chooses to do that once they become an MHK, they should resign and seek re-election. What's your stance on that? I, I agree. And So you would be doing the same thing? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the member, for the candidate for, for Liberal Vannon. I am deeply ensconced in Liberal Vannon. I'm a part of Liberal Vannon, uh, and, and I, I think that that these sort of distractions are very interesting to people, um, you know, who are interested in politics. But the things that are far more important uh, is having people who 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 rebuild our community organisations, and that's why I've got a strong track record. And that's the things that, that the voters of Douglas East have really spoken loud and hard um, to me about. We'll speak then about affordable housing, which was the the priority when Manx Radio asked you uh, that you put first and foremost. So, what is your solution to this affordable housing issue? 
Fundamentally, the current problem that we have um, with housing is it's a little bit like a game of musical chairs where we have very limited supply uh, and we have people f- fighting over the, those, those chairs. And the result being is that the big bullies are able to come in and, uh, and, and to take, take the chairs away from, from the you know, local Manx families. And so what we need to do is we need to do two things. First of all, we need to ensure that there are enough chairs for everyone, there's enough houses for everyone. Uh, and second of all, we need to ensure that, that bullies are not coming in and, uh, and speculating on houses because, you know, my, as my good friend Peter Caron likes to say, uh, houses should be about building a family nest not a nest egg for speculators. So what's your approach then? Because some people have suggested we need more ha- homes. Some people say we have enough homes, but they need to be brought to a proper standard. Others have suggested some kind of uh, controls on who can buy properties, you know, no buy to lets, no people uh, buying second homes from across. What's your, what, what, what would be your actual policies to deal with this? Sure. So the, the, the two policies are broadly around the idea of in, ensuring there's enough supply that is building, building more homes. Um, Greenfield or brownfield? So... <laughs> Let me finish sentence. But, so that that's around ensuring especially affordable housing, uh, and so I think that will be a mixture of housing. Um, you know, especially you know in in the in the centre of Douglas. You know, we have a whole series of of of, of essentially ruins, and um, where we have the Lord Street site, the Parade Street site, we have um, a Long South Key, and we have uh, North Key, and we have all these wonderful sites in the centre of our our town, in the centre of Douglas East. Um, which we can use much more effectively, and, and we, we should be using them first and foremost. Well, the government has struggled to get to grips with that issue. How would you accelerate Brownfield? Would you, would you see more government investment, better relationship with business? How would you encourage that? Okay. So, so I, I think that, that government has been an, a significant impediment. So, for example, immediately adjacent to my office on, on North Quay, which is right down there in, 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 in Douglas East, uh, you know, we have what, what was formerly the nuisance building, and it, the building is literally falling apart but the so-called experts in the government have, have prevented any development. They've prevented um, some really quite well-adjusted and, and well-considered um, plans to invest in, in, in a you know, cafe along there and then a whole bunch of housing um, in apartments in for the, which would be very affordable. Um, and so I think the first step is we've got to use what we've currently got available. We'll move to an issue that some people have raised in relation to affordable housing, wages. Do you have a policy for wages? Do you think we need to be working to increase wages? Yes, absolutely. You know, I think I think the mo- that we really need to ease the squeeze, uh, and, and that means on, on on two sides. Both, but first of all, we've got to um, do things to reduce the cost of living, uh, and so that is things like housing is obviously a big part of that. Um, and then we've also got to look for opportunities to increase wages, and that comes by increased productivity. And so that's why I'm a big fan of investing in infrastructure, um, whether it be broadband, whether it be roads, whether it be whatever other infrastructure is needed to increase productivity. Um, but second of all, in terms of of training. Uh, and vocational training, and uh, especially around ideas such as uh, giving an opportunity for for everyone to prosper, not just the elite that can go to university, um, but rather um, to enable everyone to attend um, and to train and to be productive, because that's the real way to to increase income. So, how would you do those things? Because um, some of those things that require spending. Um, would you? How, how would you fund these sort of these the, the proposals that you've outlined there? Sure. So I, I don't think a lot of them do require spending. And so, for example, um, you know, there are a lot of there's a, currently there's a significant demand for 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 tradesmen and tradeswomen, mm-hmm. um, for people to work in that, um, and that inherently implies there's an opportunity um, for apprentices um, and for for that sort of work. Um, that is that is an opportunity for 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 young people. And, and also adults who are, might be wanting to reskill to earn um, at the same time. And so I don't, I don't see, see such avenues as, as being about expenditure. I think it's about income. And do you think um, the issue with that is is some businesses, they want the qualified personnel straight away. How do you incentivize them to take on apprentices? So, so fundamentally, they need to have enough work. Uh, and so that's why I'm a big fan of building houses. So that we, you know, and, and building houses uh, is good not just... Uh, for the cost of housing, but it's also good for our, our employment opportunities. It's good for wages. It's good for the environment. Uh, and good and, for the environment. Because some people have ecological concerns about building. Okay, Greenfield, well, the, to be specific. Sure. Well, okay, well, there's no ecological concerns about building houses on North Quay or South Quay or, or on any other ruined sites. Uh, it is a tragedy that summer land has been left in ruins for for you know so many years now. What would you do with it? Well, let's let's build on it. Let's let, let's let's on it use that as an opportunity for, for housing or for, or for other community facilities. Uh, it'd be wonderful to see a, a, um, an appropriate uh, memorial for, for the tragedy that took place there. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think that 
there's no credible ecological concerns about building houses in central Douglas. Mm. Um, moving to uh, COVID recovery, we've asked uh, all our candidates about this. What do you think are the most important things the next government needs to get right for the COVID recovery of the Isle of Man economically? So the, the next opportunity, we need to bounce back better. And that means about ensuring that there are opportunities for 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 new careers. Uh, you know, I've listened to a lot of economic commentators who have said that, that the COVID year, as it were, or 18 months, has compressed maybe five or 10 years of economic development and economic change into a one and a half or so. Uh, and so that's why, uh, you know, I think that we will see increasing demand for people to work for home in, in professional careers. Um, that's why I'm a big fan of investing in broadband uh, and investing in that sort of infrastructure so that people can work from, from anywhere, but work from the Isle of Man. Um, mm-hmm. I think that secondly, we need to do things to like you know, in, invest in, in housing. One of, one of the consequences of more people living working from home is that uh, they are more likely to need more space because where they previously would have gone to work in an office for a day, they may you know, want to have a, a dedicated room for working at home, which increases the demand for space, which further increases the need for housing. Well, I want to ask you about another a priority you actually uh, outlined to Max Radio, rebuilding uh, uh, community organisations. Now, uh, can you explain a bit more about what you mean by that? I think you alluded to it at the start of the interview, but if you'd like to expand. Yeah, so I think there are a lot of organisations in our community that are struggling and some that are, that are thriving. Uh, but I think that when we look across our community, more and more people are engaging in individual activities, most obviously in the context of media consumption. So previously, people would have listened to Manx Radio all day, but now they can listen to it on podcasts, um, streaming online when and where they want. And not just on Manx Radio, but also they can listen to Amazon Prime when and where they want. They can watch you know, Netflix uh, mm. using what they want to watch and consume what they want to watch. And the result being is that we no longer have those shared, or we have a, a reduced number of shared community moments. And so that mm. means... What's that the impact of that? Do we do we lose our communities as a result? Or? I, I think that our community is weaker than it might have been 10 or 20 years ago uh, because we no longer have those shared community touchstones of, you know, for example, you know, a big divorce or a big marriage or neighbours is no longer talked about by everyone at the same time. You know, the closest, you know, maybe modern example might be something like Line of Duty. But even that, the, the ratings for Line of Duty are smaller than it was would have been 20 years ago. And... And while, of course, that's just a TV show, it means that when we meet in our coffee shops, in our offices, uh, and in our tennis clubs, in our hockey clubs, in our football clubs, we no longer have quite as many things to talk about. Uh, And especially with more people working from home, I think there's a real risk of loneliness. Uh, And so that's why I'm a big fan of supporting, you know, the equipment uh, and the infrastructure that people need. So, for example, uh, I'm, I met with the, you know, the Isle of Man Netball Association the other day, and they talk about wanting, needing more space, more facilities, because they are a wonderful opportunity, not just for people to play sport, and obviously the fitness benefits that come from that, but also the opportunities to talk and to socialise and, and, and to chat. And I think that healthy institutions are the antibodies to so many of our challenges. So governments, where does government's responsibility lie there? How would you as an MHK seek to foster that? Yeah, so I'd be a big fan of promoting community infrastructure, whether it be town halls or be community halls, whether it be, you know, whether it be netball courts or it be tennis courts, whether it be, you know, football pitches. Those are the sort of things that I'd like to see the Isle of Man government invest in in the future. What would you be, what would be your first uh, priority as an MHK should you uh, uh, be successful in this election? So I think the first priority is is about ensuring that is, is about being a strong voice uh, uh, for all of us to ensure that we have enough housing, uh, and I think that that the so accelerate the national housing strategy, perhaps. Look, I I think we need to go beyond the now, national housing strategy. I think we need to invest and in, and in, and to allow people to build. Um, and so the first thing I would want to do is I'd want to meet with local charities. I'd want to meet with local not for profit groups. I'd want to meet with um, local developers to see what we can do to 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 remove and reduce the impediments to building on sites such as uh, in the centre of our town. Do you think there's going to be appetite for those changes to plot, because we've gone through a massive area plan process already? Yeah, because I, th- I think that, that we now need to, to go beyond that area plan and that the area plan obviously covers a large chunk of area. And so we've got to speak with local residents about about you know, what is appropriate for each and every street. Um, you know, I keep coming back to it, but right in the centre of a town, uh, we literally have a whole series of sites that you know might have been bombed out, it looks like. You know, they are literally in ruins. Uh, and so these sites need to 
get construction working. We need to get people working um, and, to, and to start building. Uh, a question I've asked um, many people, you talk about being a strong voice. Would you be uh, willing to accept consensus where it had to be made in the House of Keys? Because, of course, you're going to be one of 24 should you be successful. You might not be able to win on all of your ideas. You might have to make concessions. Are you willing to do that? I, I think absolutely. You know, I think I think that's a natural you know, rationale. Uh, you know, so, so earlier in this interview, you talked about um, you know a very narrow loss in the in the Douglas South election. I was very proud that night to to shake the hand of the of the of the, of the successful candidates. Uh, I was very, you know, I, I think, and I think that what we need is we need community leadership to accept the results. Uh, I know in in our Western world it is very unfashionable to accept the results of of closely decided elections, but I was very proud to do so, and um, because I think that what is more important than you know what side of an issue you might be here and there, is that we are all on the same side of, of doing what is in, what we believe is in the interests of the people of the Isle of Man. Why should people vote for Michael Josem for Douglas East? So I think people should vote for Michael Josem because they, they know that I'm deeply involved in our community, whether it be as a volunteer for the Food Bank, for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, in our sporting clubs, in our other not-for-profit organisations. And, and I think that that track record shows that they will get someone who will be a, a, an advocate for all of us.